In part one of this series, I built this cyclone, and in part two, I built the blower. In this video, I'll be building the rest of the machine, starting with the frame that holds everything together. I'll start making the frame by making a sort of hexagon out of two-inch square tube. Since the frame is going to be clear-coated, like the other metal parts of the dust collector, I wanted the seam to be on the same side on all of these parts, which means I can't just flip them over to miter them, I have to cut a scrap out. I want to cut both of these corners off so that they're parallel with the straight part. These holes are what the motor and blower assembly will hang from later. So I needed two identical of these, so I welded together a second one. And now to get the end profile right, I'm just going to set this one on top of there and then mark it. This assembly is going to go at the very top of the frame and the motor blower assembly will hang from these four holes. So the motor will stick up through it like this. Here I'm starting on the legs, which are made from larger two by three inch tube. I think this is 14 gauge wall. And I'm using the same technique here of cutting a piece out so that the seam will be on the same side through the corner. This piece is too small to properly grip in the vise and cut it all at once, so I'm cutting one wall at a time. So here's how the top of the leg goes together, and you can see how the seam follows around the corner. This will be the bottom of the leg, or I guess you could call it the foot, and I'm going to cap the ends of it. To reinforce the corner between the leg and the foot, I made these pieces. 
I left a little bit of this wall in place just to keep the tube from collapsing. I put the side of the tube that has the seam facing the same way on all of these pieces. And I made two identical ones of these. And here I'm setting them up on the table, making sure that they're spaced correctly, parallel, and square. The feet weren't quite sitting parallel, so I used these angle irons to help hold them parallel. And this diagonal one will help keep the base square. So I have this clamped in place. I make sure that it's centered on the legs on both sides and also that this is flush across the top. And with that, it should be ready to tack it in place with just two tack welds. Then I'll take the clamps off and I still need to make sure that it's square to the frame this way. The tape wrapped around the end of this file lets me drag the tip without scratching the flat surface. It also makes it more comfortable to hold. It's hard to see, but these tubes are bowed out slightly because of the welding on this side, so it would have rested right here in the middle. That's why the feet on the ends are necessary. Here I'm making a couple of parts that later in the build will be used to hold the handle that releases the drum. You'll see how these are actually used in a few minutes. I'm not drilling into my table here. I'm drilling into the spot where someone else drilled into my table. And there's the finished part. It mounts here on the leg. Since there's gonna be a bolt going through this tapped hole, there needs to be some clearance behind it. So I'm just drilling out a hole behind it. These parts will go just below the previous parts, and they will be used to hold the lid of the dustbin.
So these little pieces go right in this corner and they're supposed to be 3 eighths of an inch from the back. So I'll use that as a spacer, tack it in place. It's pretty hard to explain at this point what these parts do, but you'll see later. These little parts will attach to the flange of the cyclone, so they need a notch ground out of the middle of them to clear the weld. To position the two tabs that I just made, I need to mount the cyclone in the frame. This board will support the bottom of the cyclone. It's acting as a stand-in for the lid of the dust bin right now, and I'm also using it to hold the correct spacing of the frame. And here I can see that I made these tabs about a quarter inch too long. Well, an eighth inch each. After cutting an eighth inch off, the cyclone fits. I made sure that the bottom of the cyclone is in the correct spot and then clamped it in place. The weight of the cyclone is supported from the bottom, so these very thin tabs are there just to support the cyclone side to side. They're intentionally thin so that they can bend a little bit if they need to. After welding everything solid, I came back and cleaned up all of the weld smoke and then sanded the frame down to make it nice and smooth. And here I'm applying a clear coat to prevent rust. With the frame done, I'm starting on building the collection bin. The bin will be a sort of square octagon, a square with the corners chopped off. So it needs 22 and a half degree miters all the way around. Here I'm cutting the corner parts of the octagon. And once I got this one to the right width, I cut four identical. And then I did the same thing for the four longer sides of the octagon. After making sure it wrapped into the shape I wanted, I applied glue and put it together permanently. This was a nerve-wracking and frustrating glue up, but it went okay. The final corner that I had to just tape once it was already wrapped up didn't go together so well, but the other seven corners went together really nicely. I 
I had just aligned all of these pieces by eye so they weren't perfectly flush and that's going to be a problem for gluing the bottom on. So I used this long stick with a piece of sandpaper adhered to it to make those corners flush. So I just set this combination square so that if I put it on top of this block, it reaches to the center. That means that if I come over to this side and I set the block just back from this overhanging edge, I can use this square to mark where the center of this plywood is. So that'll allow me to screw through this and into this plywood and be right in the center. I cut this piece oversized so after gluing it on I can trim off the excess and it'll be perfectly flush. To make the lid I cut an oversized piece of some thicker 3 quarter inch plywood and after clamping it in place I carefully flush trimmed it to match the exact shape of the bin. I had to be super careful not to let the lid shift as I moved the clamps out of the way to finish routing it. And here I'm cutting a one half inch wide rabbit along the edge to sit on the edge of the drum, which is perfect because the drum is made from 12 millimeter plywood. So this leaves 0.7 millimeters of clearance. Here I'm laying out the hole where the dust will fall through the lid and into the bin. And here I'm laying out where there will be a window in the lid to see into the bin. So this shape will be the window. I marked a quarter inch offset from the inside of the window and then used a 7 inch Forstner bit to start all of the corners to get a nice corner radius. And then I just used my router with a fence to clean up those straight lines. Here I'm clamping down my router at the correct position with this wood base and then I'm just drilling a hole through the base at the correct radius. And then I can use that same drill bit to guide the router to clean up this curved section. And here I'm using my rabbiting bit in the shaper again to create a quarter by quarter rabbit for the plexiglass window to sit in. To cut the round hole where the cyclone goes, I'm using that same technique of positioning the router where it needs to be to cut the right radius and then just drilling into the base The bearing on this flush trim bit is writing on the precise part that the router cut and cleaning up the rough part that the jigsaw cut. I rounded over all the edges and sanded it and then applied a couple of coats of wipe-on poly.
This stick holds the legs at the correct spacing, and then I can clamp the lid onto the frame. I marked where I needed to drill holes to mount this to the frame, then I put the cyclone in place and pinned it at the top so that it's in the correct orientation, made sure it was aligned with the hole at the bottom, and then marked where those holes need to go. I started all of these holes with a step drill, so I have a 3 16 hole followed up by a quarter inch counterbore. And then I finished drilling all of these with a number 7 drill bit. Not quite all the way through because I don't want to leave a leak path. And then I attached these using quarter 20 machine screws. The quarter inch counter bore from the step drill was just to prevent the plywood from delaminating where I start the screw. Kind of switching gears here, I'm going to be mounting the blower to the frame next. The blower will hang from these four carriage bolts. There's a rubber washer on both sides of the wood which seals it and also lets it wiggle just a little bit. And then there's two nuts locked together so it doesn't have to be tightened on that rubber. There you can see how it wiggles. When I made the blower, I counterbored these holes so the head of the carriage bolt will sit as close to flush as possible. That should reduce noise. Next on these bolts, there are two washers and then this rubber mount. These rubber mounts are for vibration damping. I got them from McMaster Car. And on the other side of the frame, it gets that same rubber mount, the same two washers, and then a lock nut. With the blower secured, I can stand the entire machine upright. It may have been worth undoing the wiring for this step, I'm not sure. This piece of hose will connect the cyclone outlet to the blower inlet. Since the blower is mounted on rubber, I figured it made sense to not rigidly mount it to the cyclone. The flexible hose should help prevent vibrations from transferring into the cyclone and being amplified as noise there. These hose clamps have a bridge in them to span over the coil in the hose. I lifted the cyclone up and then fed this foam rubber sheet under it. This is the same material that I used on the cyclone and the blower. And then just forced the screws through it and into the pre-drilled holes in the lid. Threading in these eight screws half a turn at a time with an alum key was probably the most unpleasant part of this whole build. Here I'm laying out some hooks that will be used to hold the drum up against the lid. The shape of these parts will make more sense in a little bit.
This hole is tapped only about three-fourths of the way, so the screw will bind when it gets all the way in. That way it holds its position. And here's a sneak peek at how that will be used. This bearing will roll up this sort of ramp and sit on top of the screw. This is a ball detent. It has a spring-loaded ball inside of a tube with a flange on the end. It comes pre-assembled like this. These hooks get assembled to the frame using a bolt, a washer, and a jam nut, and then that gets threaded into the hole in the frame. There's a hole in this tab that holds the lid, and the detent ball drops into that to hold these hooks in the upright position. The two hooks will be connected to each other by a single handle, and I want that handle to sit in a dado just to give it more strength. To make the dado exactly one inch wide, I've just put this piece of three quarter inch flat bar next to the router, so that plus the quarter inch bit makes a one inch slot. After applying some polyurethane, I reassembled this to the frame using this custom plywood wrench to tighten the jam nut because my regular wrenches are too thick. Here I'm starting on making the pieces that these hooks will interface with. So the pieces I'm making here will mount on the drum itself. I clamped each of these to a piece of I-beam and then used the belt grinder to grind a taper into one end. This will help guide the bin into place. I bought these bearings to use on my shaper and they ended up not working because they can't handle the high speed without overheating, so I'm using them here. These countersink head half inch screws worked perfectly for holding the bearings, but the end sticks out a little bit, so here I'm drilling a little clearance hole for the end of the bolt. I'm showing you this out of order just to show you where these pieces go. But now, back to actual chronological order, the next thing I did was to put this rubber window seal on the bottom of the lid. I temporarily put the bearing mounts on the sides and put the drum in place, and then holding it up against the lid, I turned the dust collector on so the vacuum would hold it. So this way the drum is in exactly the right spot and I can mark where these bearing mounts should actually go. Marking the left one was fun. I center punched where I had marked the holes and then drilled those, again starting with a step drill and then following that up with a number seven. This block keeps the drill bit straight and also makes sure that I don't drill all the way through. Drilling through would create a leak path. I attached the bearing mounts with quarter 20 machine screws. Machine screws actually work great in Baltic birch, especially when you are screwing into thin material and you don't want the screws to go too deep. A larger diameter screw can get a better bite without going so deep. Here you can see how the bearing sits on top of the screw in the hook. The screw allows me to adjust it up and down to adjust how much the seal is compressed. Now I'm working on the handle, starting by putting a cap on the end of this one inch square tube. I'm transferring the hole locations from the hooks, so I can drill those before I assemble the handle.
Here you can see how those slopes on the bearing mount guide it into place. And those rectangles attached to the frame are what guides the bearing up instead of it getting pushed back by the hook. The next part is going to be a frame that holds a bag open inside the drum. This frame will go at the top of the bin to hold the top of the bag open, but there needs to be some legs that go down into the bin to hold the bottom of the bag open. For that I'll use this inch and a half by half square tube with the end filled and ground smooth so that it doesn't puncture the bag. I made these by filling the end of the tube with a piece of half inch round bar and then just welding that solid in place. Burning my glove with it and then grinding it smooth with the belt grinder. This is a super fine polishing belt, and I'm using the slack part of it on the bottom to get it really smooth. So here's how this bag holder works. The bag just goes over the frame, and then you'll notice I'm folding it inward. So the bag does not go over the edge of the bucket, it just goes inward over the frame, so there's room along these sides. This way the pressure will be more equal inside and outside the bag, so it doesn't collapse the frame. The bag does still get pulled inward, but not with enough force to damage the frame. Next up I'll make the 90 degree transition that goes from the blower to the top of the filters. This needs to smoothly bend 90 degrees and also shift from a rectangle to roughly a circle. I'm going with an octagon because that's easier to work with. The actual transition will be made out of steel. Here I'm just making an MDF form to bend that around. You'll notice I cut some material out of the center of the curved piece. That's so that later it can collapse to be removed from the finished metal part. The steel I'm using for this started as a rusty piece of scrap material that has a bunch of holes in it, so I designed the piece in CAD to nest my parts around the holes. All of the metal parts got screwed to the form to make sure they stayed in place while I welded them. The seam is nice and tight all the way along up here, but in this area there's a gap. So I'm going to put this block right here and just clamp that down. This process was very tedious, but it was actually really straightforward and worked just great. So I think this is a technique I might try to use more in the future. Here you can see I'm using a clamp to help pull that gap closed.
and then I welded the whole thing solid with a million tack welds. To mount the octagon end of this to the top of the filters, I'm cutting out a circle that's the same diameter as the filters, and then inside of that circle will be an octagon that the end of the transition fits into. For the rectangle end of the transition, I also want a wooden flange, so I'm making that out of four sticks with half lap joints. I'm marking where that flange will attach to the blower, and then I can use a router to route out that area so it will sort of interlock with the end of the blower. After securing the bottom of it, I used a square to make sure that both of the flanges are square to each other, and then I can secure the other side. I didn't give myself very much clearance for these bottom screws, so I had to tighten them a quarter turn at a time with a wrench and a driver bit. Here I'm applying some silicone to seal up that joint. Before I can attach the filters, I need a clean-out box that will go at the bottom of the filters. And I want this box to sort of match the transition at the top, so I'm going to make an octagon out of thin metal, so it'll look the same. I'm shaping this piece using the same octagon form that I used for the transition, so it'll be exactly the same shape and size. The corners of this piece are not quite 45 degrees, because it needs to fit when it's sitting on an angle. Here I'm using it to mark out and cut a second piece, and those two get attached together. That will create an angled baffle that goes in the cleanout box, so that will direct any dust that falls into this box to one side. And I made this out of two pieces, just to save material. I don't want that hole there anymore. I sanded down this MDF disc until it just 
fit in the end of a shop vac attachment. The strip of metal that I'm bending around this will form a little clean out port that I can plug the shop vac into. I'm starting by bending both ends of this strip around the form. And after I finish bending it most of the way, I can cut off the end that has the little flat spot where the clamp was. That way it has a nice crisp bend all the way to the end. Once I finished bending it, I could mark and then cut off the other ugly end. And now I can hose clamp that around the form to pull it really tight. I took it back off the form and used a Forstner bit to create some relief where I can weld on the inside. The shop vac port gets welded on at the front, near the bottom of the angled baffle. This piece of flat bar will just give the cleanout box a flat bottom surface. And then this curved piece is just a scrap of material that I found, and it'll act as a reinforcement. I wanted that bottom flat bar to stick out by about a sixteenth of an inch, so that's what these shims on the sides are for. Going back to the shop vac port, I had to hog out some material to relieve the pressure so that I could get this form out. And now I'm drilling and then clipping in between the drilled holes to remove the material from the inside of the port. This piece will get welded on right here, and it needs to be bent 90 degrees along this line. Trimming off some excess length before I bend it. This piece will be used to attach the cleanout box to the frame. I'm making some vertical slots that will give it some vertical adjustment. I made another wood disc the diameter of the filters and cut an octagon out of the center. I didn't film this one because it's exactly the same as the one on the transition. The side that has the shop vac port was really warped from welding it, but these screws pulled it tight so it's pretty flat now. To attach the filters to the transition on the top and the cleanout box on the bottom, I'm modifying some hose clamps. The filters have a little ledge that runs along the edge of them, so these hooks will hook over that ledge. And then the other part of the hose clamp gets attached to the plywood disc. To seal the filters to each other and to the plywood discs, I'm using the same weather stripping that I used on the drum. And here you can see how my modified hose clamps work to pull that filter against the disc. I need to secure the filters to each other, so I'm modifying this part of the hose clamp in the same way, but then I'm bending two hooks into the other part of the hose clamp, so it's hooks on both ends of this one. The next step will be to put the filters in their final location, so before I can do that I need to tap two holes in the frame for that angled bracket that's attached to the cleanout box. I'm leaving these bolts just a little loose for now, that way I can lift the whole stack of filters up against the filter transition on the top 
and then I can put this shim underneath it and then tighten those bolts. I did it this way so that the filters are supported from the bottom. They're not just hanging from those hose clamps. Almost there. The final part of this build will be this little plug that can plug up the shop back hole in the cleanout box. So this is designed to be able to remove this plug and put a shop vac hose in there. Then I can blow compressed air backward through the filter to knock the dust off the inside. It falls down into the cleanout box and the shop vac sucks it out. And that's it. It's done. Yikes, that's a lot of dust, which means my cyclone doesn't work very well. I hated this project. It took about six and a half months, start to finish, and it cost about $2,400, which is only maybe four or $500 better than something like a Clearview. And this is pretty much a copy of a Clearview. The performance, I don't have an accurate way to measure the CFM, but the motor's only drawing a little over 12 amps and drawing that little power, it just can't be moving very much air, like laws of physics. So I think the CFM is not very good. The static pressure is about 15 inches of water, which is fine. I think that's fairly average. The noise level is about 88 decibels, which is absolutely terrible. That's like over twice as much noise as a clear view. So yeah, performance is bad. It took forever to build and saved me a tiny bit of money. At least it looks cool in my opinion. I could likely improve quite a bit of this stuff by just replacing the impeller. The impeller could be quite a bit larger diameter and also a little bit taller in order to move more air since clearly the motor is not overloaded. That's the reason I made this impeller this small. I thought the motor would be overloaded, but I can upsize it without overloading anything. Building it with more blades would help a lot with the noise, I think. But right now I'm way too burnt out on this project. I'm not gonna change anything about it for a long time. In an upcoming video, I'll be doing all of the ducting using PVC pipe for the ducting, and I'll be making some of the junctions and gates myself. I think also in that video, I'll be adding a bin level sensor as well as something to measure the pressure on the filters so that I know if they need to be cleaned. So yeah, I think that's it for this one. I hope you enjoyed watching it more than I enjoyed doing it. Thanks for watching.